Welcome, everybody, to the second session of the inaugural Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies Health Services Research Symposium. We're really delighted to have you all participating in this session and hope you will uh, join us for future sessions. Uh, you know, as you know, this was originally scheduled to be an in-person event uh, in May of 2020. Uh, we all are aware of what happened and we've moved to a virtual event, which has actually been a benefit to enhance accessibility to participation, even at the sacrifice of some intimacy of all being together in the same room. Uh, the, the first uh, symposium session was last week and there will be two more uh, to follow in the subsequent weeks. Do check out the Institute for Health Policy Studies Twitter feed uh, where you'll uh, get access to posters and highlights of the symposium and continued notifications about upcoming symposium. Today's symposium session is on the theme of advancing health equity, health services research and social determinants of health. I am uh, delighted to be the moderator for this session. I am Kevin Grumbach. I am chair and professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at UCSF and an affiliated faculty with the Institute for Health Policy Studies. I did my fellowship in health, health services research and health policy at IHPS back in the last millennium. So have deep roots and the Institute has been a really formative uh, influence over my own career development. So it's really an honor to be here today participating in this session. What I'd like to do is start by introducing our four fabulous speakers today. Uh, the format for today's session is we're gonna have each of them give uh, some brief introductory remarks uh, talking about their approach to health services research, addressing social determinants of health, issues of health equity. And then we're gonna open it up to more of a question and answer in interactive format. So if you have uh, comments or questions, please don't use the chat, use the question and answer, a Q and A, a function in your Zoom, and we will be reviewing those and then incorporating them into our uh, Q and A session in the latter portion of the symposium today. So. Let me introduce our, um, our uh, speakers today, uh, and I'll go in alphabetical order. The first uh, person I would like to introduce is Laura Gottlieb. Laura is a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine here at UCSF. She's the director of the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, also known as SIREN. She is a member of the National Academy of, Men of Medicine and first came to UCSF to do a postdoc as a Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholar uh, that was also uh, partly connected with the Institute for Health Policy Studies. Rita Hamad is an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the uh, Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. She's the director of the Social Policies for Health Equity Research Program, also known as SVIR. Uh, she received her medical degree at UCSF her PhD in social epidemiology at Stanford. Uh, she's currently the American Board of Family Medicine James Puffer Fellow at the National Academy of Medicine. Tu Wen is Assistant Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, she uh, is also uh, one of the leaders of the Center for Health Equity Affiliated Faculty to really promote more engagement of uh, uh, epidemiologic social science researchers across the country to look at issues of equity and particularly racism. Uh, she got her graduate degree in science, uh, doctor of science at Harvard and then came to UCSF for her postdoctoral uh, training before uh, becoming a member of the faculty. Matt Pantel is an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine and the Center for Health and Community at UCSF. Matt is a true blue San Franciscan uh, born and raised in San Francisco, uh, did his medical school training at UCSF, did his residency here in pediatrics. So a, a, a true San Franciscan on the panel here. Uh, he's currently uh, a K scholar under the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Learning Health System, uh, uh, Learning Health System Scholars Program. Uh, is one of the inaugural fellows of that program to really embed uh, researchers more within healthcare delivery organizations, a theme that will be uh, highlighted at next week's symposium as well. So again, I, I will turn it over to our, uh, our presenters today and let me start with Laura. And I think the framing question really is to give an orientation to how 
do you in your research and scholarly work approach the issues of health equity, particularly within the framework of thinking about the broader social determinants of health? So Laura, handing it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I'm totally delighted to be included in this panel of um, friends and colleagues. Um, and uh, really glad that IHPS decided to um, include this as one of the few topics that could be included when we switch to the uh, webinar events. Um, so welcome everybody. I don't think it's gonna come as any surprise to any of the listeners today that uh, social determinants are in vogue right now in health services uh, and therefore in health services research as well. And it's, um, I mean, I, I think the result of, you know, this large, strong, compelling body of evidence that many of our um, co-faculty at UCSF have actually participated in demonstrating that social conditions impact health outcomes. Um, but it would be a mistake to also not look at sort of why exactly now when that evidence has been around for quite some time. Um, it's also become increasingly obvious that we spend a lot on medical care and we get pretty crummy results um, for all the amount that we're spending on medical care and we get very disparate results. Um, and then in an effort to control spending, we also are now living through this sort of historic shift to value-based uh, payment models. And those three factors together, I think have really um, helped kind of be a trifecta um, that has led the US healthcare sector to seriously consider what its roles and responsibilities are around addressing patients' social conditions uh, to improve health and health equity. So that, the role of the healthcare sector in addressing social adversity um, is really the focus of our research network, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, Siren. So I just thought it would be fun to take my few minutes um, from that launching point to talk a little bit about um, a framework for that work that was produced by the National Academy of Medicine um, uh, uh, by a committee that convened in 2018 under the leadership of our very own Kirsten Bivens Domingo um, with the explicit goal of surfacing and evaluating practice, policy, and research in this very rapidly evolving space of the healthcare sector's role around social determinants. The framework, I think, is a really useful way to just conceptualize the health services work in this area, and we'll, I think it'll set Matt up nicely, and then hopefully we can transition to sort of even beyond the healthcare sector with Rita and too. Um, so the, the, I'm going to just show a slide here. So that NAM framework starts with this uh, category that uh, NAM referred to as awareness or activities designed to surface the social risks and assets of patients and populations. So just for some grounding um, examples of our research in this space um, have been uh, ways in which our team is examining the validity, the acceptability, the implementation of social risk screening tools that are, we're increasingly seeing adopted in healthcare uh, clinical spaces. And some of those Matt I'll talk about in a few minutes. But the, the NAM social care framework goes on to define different ways that the healthcare delivery systems might then intervene on social adversity. Um, one of those approaches is to ensure that health systems adjust the medical care that's provided based on information about patient social risks and assets. So for instance, could we more consistently leverage health informatics tools like real-time pharmacy benefits to ensure that each and every time we see a patient, we're prescribing the lowest cost medications um, when that patient might be experiencing financial strain. The framework also underscores the importance of interventions intended to provide assistance related to social needs. And this is where it's some big questions that I hope will come up in the, in the um, Q&A um, come, they, they arise related to um, the medicalization of social determinants. And, and I think that's kind of a, a relevant topic for today's conversation. Um, but as an example, our team has done some randomized clinical trials on the health and healthcare utilization impacts of including social care navigators in clinical settings. So then um, finally, the National Academies Committee, Committee's framework moves on to talk about more community-focused strategies, um, ways that healthcare systems might 
in, engage at a community level, including through activities to align healthcare systems organizational practice, practices with what we know shapes health. So like this could include ensuring healthcare systems pay employees living wages, they commit to green building, they purchase locally, um, and then certainly advocacy, advocacy um, for policies and practices that will lead to social equity. And I think that will certainly be a part of Rita's talk. So with all that said, um, I'm just gonna be perfectly transparent that it has really felt in our work that as researchers, we are just racing to catch up with the innovation that's happening in this area. And, and some of that is um, really trying to uh, make sure that all of that innovation is not only about addressing social adversity, but to also ensuring that, that uh, those interventions are leading to the changes in health equity that we are hoping that they will lead to. Um, and I think the evidence is not yet perfectly clear that the medical care sector's actions in this area are, are gonna do that. Um, and, and that's incumbent on us as researchers to start to prove. So with that framing, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt uh, to talk more about some social informatics work that he's been doing and hopefully we'll uh, just launch this great conversation. Thanks. Um, well, so as, um, as Kevin mentioned, it, uh, I, I work here as a pediatrician and I work in uh, several different health systems. So Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, Benioff Children's Hospital, Mission Bay, and then Washington Hospital in Fremont, which UCSF Pediatrics uh, staffs. And so as a learning health system researcher, I'm interested in sort of how we implement social determinants of health screening interventions, you know, in whatever health system we're working and what lessons can we learn from each of these different places to then apply more broadly. Um, and, you know, much of my research, as Laura alluded to, focus on, uh, focuses on something called social informatics, which is an emerging field that's focused on the application of information technologies to capture and apply social data in conjunction with health data uh, in order to advance indivi individual and uh, population health. So I, I conduct products that essentially leverage the social data that's contained in EHRs to investigate relationships between social determinants of health and health and healthcare uh, utilization outcomes. And then I'm also interested in investigating how EHR systems can be used to facilitate interventions that address social needs. So using the 5A framework that uh, Laura so nicely just presented on, uh, I'll outline examples of sort of social informatics research questions that we're either currently pursuing or planning to pursue. So in terms of um, uh, awareness, you know, uh, a research question in social informatics might be, you know, is documentation of unstable housing associated with increased healthcare utilization? And we can pull this data, and we have pulled this data from EHRs about unstable housing and seeing how it is related to increased healthcare utilization. You know, for adjustment, does scheduling multiple subspecialist appointments on the same day um, reduce the risk of missing appointments among patients that have transportation needs? And we can pull that data from the EHR as well. Uh, for assistance, you know, does providing patient referrals to address their social needs lead to reduced acute healthcare uh, utilization? And for alignment, working with our community-based organization partners, you know, we, we're asking, does an EHR-based platform that allows for two-way communication between providers and community-based organizations that address social needs help to improve uh, patient health? And then finally, you, you can imagine if you're doing a really good job screening for transportation need in your health system and sort of documenting it, then you might look at, you know, in which zip codes are the highest rates of medical transportation need. And if we had all that data from um, San Francisco General, you could sort of advocate for, you know, having a new muni line running from a certain uh, area that has a lot of transportation need to the hospital. And then I just wanted to sort of on this slide show you how we, um, some of the ways we capture social determinants of health data and EHRs uh, using the San Francisco Department of Public Health's EHR um, as an example, their version of EPIC. And there are many, many ways to sort of do this work. This is just one example. As you can see here on the, on the left, there's sort of these icons for social determinants that uh, you can hover over when you're seeing a patient and then select the social determinant of which you're interested and then click on it and it'll give you a screening question. So clicking on utilities in the past 12 months has the electric gas oil or water company threatened to shut off services to your home. Yes, no, or already shut off. So since the patient says already shut off, now their icon turns red 
alerting the next provider who opens this that someone is having utility uh, need. And you can see the house is red as well, indicating um, unstable housing. It turns green if they don't have the need and it's gray if they haven't been asked. Yellow is something that's sort of medium risk that uh, I won't get into, but um, once this is done, you can hover over something that says find community resources. And then you can then select community resources by the sort of service provided, financial assistance, housing and security, food, and it will pull up a list of um, a list of resources uh, relevant to your patient's uh, zip code, and then you can print that in the AVS. Um, now, this is not you know happening 100% of the time, but this is the type of thing that you can look at the back end in the in the EHR and see who's doing the screening for which patients are they getting resources, and after that, are these things related to their um, healthcare outcomes and their utilization outcomes? So that's some of what we're doing in uh, social informatics. And I will uh, hand it over now to uh, Rita. All right, so I'm gonna zoom out a bit from the clinical setting that Matt and Laura described to the broader socio-ecological framework of population health. And for those who aren't familiar with this framework, it sets up a model for understanding the determinants of health, starting with more proximal individual risk factors, that little circle at the bottom, like smoking and alcohol use. And then each of these is nested within an increasingly upstream determinant of health, like social relationships, living conditions, neighborhoods, institutions, and policies. And all of these exist within the larger socio-political historical environment that includes manifestations of racism, sexism, all the other isms. <clears throat> so traditionally, health services research is captured in the institutions level, which includes things like hospitals and clinics. But this panel that you're listening to today is highlighting how traditional health services research doesn't exist within a vacuum. And I'm going to be talking about how socioeconomic factors and policies in particular are important to consider. And I'm going to do this by giving two quick examples of studies that illustrate this point, both of which were coincidentally published in the journal Health Services Research. So the first example is a study in which we examine the effects of job insecurity during the Great Recession on healthcare utilization. Here we used a panel of about 10,000 continuously insured, continuously employed workers at a major American manufacturer. And about half of these employees worked at plants where there were a lot of layoffs. And those are the red line in this figure. And the other half worked at low layoff plants, the blue line. So the x-axis here is time and the vertical line in the middle is January 2009, which is sort of the peak of the recession when the layoffs took place. And prior to the recession, trends in outpatient utilization on the y-axis were pretty similar between the two groups. But then after the recession, there was an uptick in utilization at the low layoff plants, while outpatient utilization in the high layoff plants was fairly steady. So keep in mind, this is a cohort study. We're following the same individuals over time. So the slight uptick in outpatient utilization overall may just represent aging of the sample over this period. And examining emergency department utilization tells the rest of the story. So we see that the low layoff plants had no major change here, again, the blue line, but there was a substantial increase in the high layoff plants. And this illustrates how social factors like stress or fear of job loss may lead people to forego outpatient care and end up in the ED instead. <clears throat> and this highlights the importance of examining social and economic determinants of healthcare utilization beyond just determinants like insurance coverage or payment reform. And you can imagine the importance of doing similar studies in our current pandemic world. This next example is about one possible intervention to address limited healthcare access among those facing financial difficulties. And this study looked at the effects of the Earned Income Tax Credit or EITC, which is the largest US poverty alleviation program for families with children. It's dispersed each year as a large tax refund and over 25 million people get an average benefit size of about $3,000 a year. So here we examined whether there were any changes in a range of out-of-pocket expenditures after people got the benefit. And in this sample, we had over a million individuals and we did not find an effect on total spending or on any category of spending, including inpatient, outpatient, emergency, dental. Um, and so it's possible that low income people just don't spend this annual lump sum benefit on healthcare. And qualitative studies have suggested that the EITC is more likely to be spent on durable goods or housing or other big ticket items, as well as paying down debt. And so what this study implies is that we need to carefully examine how interventions and policies to address social determinants of health actually affect healthcare utilization, since the results aren't always as expected. 
And importantly, there are a lot of studies that show that the EITC does improve health outcomes. So clearly recipients are spending the funds on resources that improve their health, and those resources just may not happen to include actual healthcare spending. So I'm gonna stop there and I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Hi everyone. Um, so I'll be the next and last panel speaker. Um, thank you for the organizers and Kevin for moderating. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, broadly, my research agenda focuses on understanding social and cultural factors and their impact on health. Um, so I've studied things such as educational attainment, race, ethnicity, and social economic status across um, several different levels. Um, but for the last few years, I focused on um, racism as a driver of health inequities um, for a number of reasons. After seeing just the documentation of racial ethnic health disparities, um, instead of racism, I think a lot of times we're trying to, we're, try, we're looking at, um, instead of race, we're looking at racism or it's, um, it's work on inequities. And so I started off in this area in one particular setting, the healthcare setting. So examining experiences of discrimination in the healthcare setting. So we know that there are um, inequities in the receipt of clinically appropriate care by race ethnicity. And of course there are stark and uh, persistent um, disparities in a variety of different health outcomes also by race ethnicity. And one of increasingly aware that um, discrimination might be explaining this, but there isn't, a lot of data, especially at the national level, to, under, to even um, understand how common these experiences are and if they're uh, related to particular health outcomes. So the health retirement study recently released or implemented a few questions asking about discrimination and one of the settings was healthcare discrimination. So I use HRS, um, it's a nationally longitudinal study of adults 15 and over, and um, I found that it was quite common. So among older adults with chronic conditions, about one in five people reported having experienced healthcare discrimination. And those who experienced um, healthcare discrimination were at increased risk of elevated HbO1c and C-reactive protein. And so after working in this area, I discovered that I wanted to um, advance this area and, and continue to investigate racism broadly, but I wanted to figure out how I could contribute. And I realized a lot of research in this area focuses on self-reported experiences of discrimination at the individual level. So one contribution I can make was um, looking at other levels and seeing their influence. So I wanted to study um, the social context and how racial bias at um, an area level could impact health. Um, and at the time, and still today, it's true that social media is an increasing part of our lives and public health research is starting to look at how we can use this to study health outcomes. Um, people have studied, use Twitter data, for example, to study food and physical activity, try and predict the flu epidemics, a variety of different topics, but nobody had yet looked at Twitter to look at racial attitudes and racial bias. Um, so that's what I have been doing for the last few years. And when creating this area level measure at the state and county level, um, I think of it as an indicator of cultural racism, which David Williams defined as the infusion of ideology of racial inferiority in the values, language, imagery, and symbols and unsafe assumptions of society. So we see this cultural racism expressed in the media and stereotypings and social and cultural norms. So in this way, Cultural racism, racism is systemic and it forms the foundation um, that produces individual and institutional level discrimination. So after creating um, this measure using natural language processing, so looking at millions of tweets and creating um, state and county indicators of racial sentiment, um, I found that it was related. To, so states and counties with higher or more negative racial sentiment towards minorities as expressed on Twitter, also had increased risk of low birth weight, very low birth weight in patient birth um, among mothers during birth for those particular years in those specific areas. And then since Twitter data is constantly being, since people are constantly tweeting and we are continuing to collect um, Twitter data, we can measure things as they are occurring. And this has been a big year for many reasons. So we've been using Twitter data to measure changes in racial sentiment following events. So this particular slide shows the spike in negative Asian sentiment following the emergence of COVID. 
and um, I'll stop there for now. Thanks all four of you. Thanks for a very, a very succinct but effective way of really sort of opening our vistas on the different ways of approaching uh, work on social determinants and health equity. I guess, you know, you each are, have your own distinctive approach to this and working within frameworks. Uh, Laura presented the National Academy of Medicine, sort of social um, needs framework, and then Rita, the broader social ecological framework. So I, I guess I, how do you all think about this in the world of health services research? Do you see this as health services research? Do you think we need to push the boundaries of health services research if we're gonna really start uh, incorporating more uh, study of social determinants and what they mean for healthcare as well as health? So you know, what are, you know, Jay, why don't we open it up to all our uh, members on the panel and yeah, anybody, do, do you, do, do you feel like, yeah, I'm, this is like central health services research, or do you feel like we need to really um, think a bit differently about how we've traditionally approached health services research based on the type of work you all are doing? I mean, to, to, I mean to, yeah, go ahead, Laura, yeah. I think the work that uh, we're doing that is very, um, uh, centered in the healthcare sector is, pretty easily uh, defined as health services research. I think the more interesting questions come when it when we talk about um, Rita and Tu's work that that is, you know, is health services the right word? Is uh, is uh, you know, in in as much as health services has really been defined by healthcare services research, like should we be changing it to population health research? Um, can, can the umbrella of health services be broad enough that it can incorporate these really important influences that, um, that is the focus of this great population health research that, is, that, uh, that people are um, you know, doing, uh, that is cl so clearly linked to health services outcomes. Um, like it, Rita, I think those two slides were so good because they were really showing like, you're looking at healthcare services outcomes in your work. Um, but we wouldn't have called those health services interventions. So I see that as a bridge. And then I think really the question is like, can we go beyond that? Does it have to have an outcome that is a health care services outcome? I'll just, I'll end there, but I'd love to hear you, both of you guys too and read to talk about that. Yeah, and that was sort of why I included those two studies. Um, there's plenty of research that we do that looks at social and economic policies with outcomes that are outside of the healthcare setting. Um, but I thought these two were interesting because because they did look at that and they did demonstrate that there's this you know potential for changes in healthcare utilization from these external factors. Um, and at the very end of of um, my little short presentation, I you know I sort of hinted at that, which is that okay if you looked at that one study, you'd say oh that well the EITC doesn't affect healthcare utilization, but actually we know the EITC affects health. So if you were really sort of narrowly thinking of healthcare health services research as what happens in the healthcare setting, you'd think oh this is like not a great intervention to improve my patient's health when when actually it is. But you you might just not measure it if you're restricting your outcomes to um, to, to the, the ones in, you know, in your little domain. Um, so I would say that, you know, the, the boundary is sort of blurry between health services research and population health. I think population health is sort of the more all encompassing one. Um, and health services research is nested within that and that health services researchers should at the very least be aware of all this stuff happening around them that influences what's going on with their patients. Um, if not like dabble, dabble in that field themselves. Any others? Yeah, two. Yeah. Yeah, I was, th I was thinking like, like going from what Rita was saying that there seems to be well, there's very rich clinical data and health services data, and then there's also rich social data. And so I think we are like what Matt is doing, like kind of merging the two or incorporating social determinants directly in um, the patient visit and being able to more like facilitate resources. But I think there is so much opportunity there. Um, and so in like combining the two, the two spheres and advancing both because there is, there's strength in, um, in what has been measured and collected and used in clinical data and clinical care. But then there's a whole set of researchers doing the other like kind of almost in, 
in isolation. I think we're being, we are bringing together these two worlds, but I think even more advancement in merging these two types of data together to, to, to advance like um, population health and health for the patients. I think that's one of the next directions. And I think um, sometimes in, when we talk about social determinants of health, we talk about very broadly like education or race or inc income occupation. But I think we can be more specific and, and investigate what about those things? Um, and like our measures could be more specific also. So then we can actually design interventions that um, might uh, uh, like target what is really being, um, what is really needed. So more specificity. And also um, I think when I was looking at Twitter data, it seems totally weird, but I think one of the investments would be to be weird, like to just like, just not be afraid to like be out there. And tr I guess like, um, yeah, to like try try new things and um, see how we can use different assumptions, different data sources to kind of get at what we want. And I was going to add on to to what she was just saying is I, I completely agree and and something we've been talking about in sort of the in social informatics is how it's you know there's so much data out there that's siloed even within our own you know health informatics systems. But you know what if you could not only merge all of this this individual clinical data with the area level data and with the data sets that population health scientists are working on. And if we could see that this patient is coming from an area where, you know, Twitter racism has been extremely high, you know, what if you could leverage all of that and connect all of that data to really start, um, you know, taking some of these things that might be traditionally seen as outside of health services research, but really do you have an influence on, on, the more traditional health services research. What if you could merge all of that to really look more in a more detailed way um, and combine that together? So I think um, she brings up a great point. So I'm going to I'm going to pick up the thank you. There's Q uh, questions coming in on the uh, Q and A function, so please keep them coming. So first of all, let it be said that at the second uh, session of the inaugural uh, Institute for Health Policy uh, Health Services Research Symposium. We had the wisdom shared to get weird in your research. That that's that's the secret to uh, doing creative health services research. So uh, I would take that to heart. Hey, Loretta uh, uh, Sway, uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing the the name correctly, but uh, I thought this is a really provocative chat uh, or comment because um, if if you're starting then to research social determinants, the type of things you're talking about, you know public policy around income support, um, about job stability or threatened job loss and layoffs and the risk of unemployment, about racism and how that plays out in social media. You, I think there is a bit of an obligation to carry that forward once you detect the signal there about therefore some policies or thing needs to change. So I'm interested in your all thinking because you're, you're operating in a space where it seems as you know, a commenter said, there's really then clear implications around uh, if there's a health benefit for earned earn income tax credit, or if social media racist tweeting is associated with part of a culture that is uh, leading to poor birth outcomes in a region. Uh, you know, how, do, how do you as researchers help move that translation into the world of advocacy and policy change? I can, I can start speaking to that since um, a lot of what I do is, is looking at the effects of policies. Um, so just to put a couple of disclaimers out there, as academics, there are limits on what we're allowed to do in sort of the advocacy space. You know, we're not allowed to like go to the legislature, leg legislators and say, I support policy X on behalf of UCSF. Um, but we are allowed to sort of present like, what does the evidence show thus far about these policies? Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and the other disclaimer is that, you know, we should always be humble that because we did one study that found like some policy is or isn't helpful, that's not the end all be all and our, you know, studies are all within like a larger body of work that need to be contextualized looking at different kinds of outcomes in different populations, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that being said, when it sort of becomes clear that there is a policy that does have downstream effects on health or healthcare utilization. 
Um, I, I'm sort of still still learning about the best ways to convey that other than publishing it in, um, in a journal. Uh, there are opportunities to put together policy briefs that we can share, for example, through the, you know, UCSF has a government relations office or the media relations office. Um, uh, you know, I, I've been invited a couple of times by um, different um, sort of not advocacy groups, but sort of like nonprofits that are trying to share information with legislators. Um, so there's the opportunity to speak directly to, to some of their staff. Um, and that way, you know, it's, you know, a lot of us are doing this work because we want to have a translational impact and, and, and affect population health. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's always looking for those opportunities um, to do that. Too, do you take, I mean, the implications when you, like when you publish an article saying, wow, we're picking up, you know, anti-Asian Asian sentiment after the coronavirus uh, was first, um, you know, sort of publicized as emanating from China and, um, or you've done, you know, other work on adverse health outcomes. I mean, do, is there, is there a group that then says, hmm, we need to come up with some proposed policy changes in social media? Or do you just put it out there and say, hmm, maybe Jack Dorsey will read this and uh, think about his Twitter policy? Oh, yes. I mean, this is something that I think about. Um, yes, and it's still something I think about and have challenges with. So then one of the, one of the common beliefs is that it's so big what I'm trying to measure, like social and cultural norms and racial attitudes, do they really change? Can you actually change them? They are, they're just so fixed. But then if you look at um, the data, they're not fixed. They are not immutable. They change and are modified. Like um, we can see that very clearly this year um, in bad ways for um, Asian sentiment, but potentially, but good ways for, we saw the Black Lives Matter movement. We also track um, racial sentiment during during those months too, we saw like a a big drop um, in negative black sentiment and increase in positive racial sentiment. And, and reading the qual the data and analyzing it qualitatively, we're seeing like a huge upswell in support and um, for um, black lives and um, an increasing recognition of the role of racism. So then, if we even operating at the, in the clouds, like the, the social milieu, we are seeing um, changes occurring. So then how the big question is how to leverage like events or changes that are happening and then how to use that to support um, lasting policy changes or, or like local changes when we're, when we're tackling these. Oh, that's great. Too, there's also a question maybe you could just answer in Q&A about are, are the, the database you access publicly available or how could people do it? So maybe if you scroll through the Q&A, you could just type in an answer to that. Hey, Matt and Laura, both, you, yours is, you're really looking at often institutional change because you're doing your research, again, often embedded or within systems. I know, Matt, you basically talked about using the EHR, whether it's at San Francisco Health Network or uh, Benioff Children's or the other UCSF Health. And Laura, I mean, you've been doing a lot with both Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services on some of their programs. So do you, yeah, do you feel like, okay, your researchers are in, is in this world where there is an audience that is, is looking at what you're coming up with, that it's playing into some of those decisions? Matt, you want to go first? Sure. I, I, I could, I could talk about at sort of more the healthcare system level. And I think, um, absolutely, you know, at, at a healthcare system level, I think, you know, there, there's growing interest in understanding how social determinants, you know, uh, play into health and health care. But I think, and while I think there's, you know, there are leaders who are, are interested in addressing social needs for, you know, the, the moral reasons, there's also, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can show how it can benefit a system that might have finite resources. You know, for example, if, if, if um, you know, San Francisco has is funding all of SFDPH and also funding housing. And, and we see that patients who are unstably housed are coming in and to the emergency room more often, you know, might they be interested in providing housing to help with that and then take some of that cost away from the ED and putting it into something that's more preventative, like stable housing and access to medications and transportation. And, um, you know, and similarly, even on a more micro health system level, you know, there are departments that we've found, uh, you know, that we didn't even know this was happening. We just 
happened to to run into them at sort of like meetings that it's like, oh yeah, we, we started a transportation needs assessment program and providing transportation because patients weren't able to get home and they were staying here many, many more days, you know, and, it, and it's, and so a lot of people, even though they're interested in doing, addressing social needs, because it's sort of the right thing to do, actually have found ways to show that it really can benefit on a health system level or a local government uh, level financially to, to do this type of work. Laura, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I also threw in a comment in the in the Q and A to Loretta about this question. So I, I love this question, um, and I you know I I have been so delighted over the course of the last decade that I've been doing this research to see the change in state uh, Medicaid agencies at CMS in the Office of National um, Coordinator for Health Information Technology to sort of watch as the the um, policy makers have really tried to incorporate the research that we're producing um, and just the innovation that's happening in this space and say, well, how can we facilitate this? Um, how, how can we design our policy or interpret policy in a way that can make this happen um, more seamless, seamlessly um, for healthcare systems? And then for the partners, the community uh, agencies and social service agencies that are uh, like critical partners for this work. So, you know, I gave some examples in the, in the chat, but, you know, we're seeing um, CMS just issued uh, in early January a new letter to state saying, well, hey, these are all the ways in which you could enter, you, you know, you could design a demonstration or, a, you know, under an 1115 waiver to incorporate social care into your um, your Medicaid program uh, there in California or where in any other state. And that included paying for, you know, one-time transitional housing costs or housing support specialists or other ways to um, support uh, social uh, actions to uh, address social adversity. Humana has just, um, is using the, the Primary Care Act uh, with their, their value-based um, insurance design program to give extra food benefits to patients who need them. Um, and that's all because of legislation that's come out of the, the federal government um, that has enabled more flexibility in the way we use healthcare dollars. So I really think there are a lot of different ways um, that we can quote unquote advocate just by showing the research on these connections to the policymakers who are interpreting, uh, designing and interpreting policy. Maybe, Laura, if I can follow up on that. Joseph Yeb made a comment in chat, you know, the Q&A about how, yeah, academic health centers, there's such a small actual volume of, of the acute hospital care that goes on or even in ambulatory care. I, I mean, you have been doing a lot of this though well outside just the academic health center framework, right? Whether it was the Oregon, the Ocean Group or with CMS yeah. participants. Do you want to speak a little bit how we get this out of just the traditional academic health centers into a broader health systems? Yeah, I mean, I, to be fair, uh, it's a good it's a um, it's a good point because in some cases the academic health centers are actually leading the way, um, but but uh, not in in all cases. And I think a lot of people would say the community health centers have been leading the way since the 1960s on this particular front around integrating social care into healthcare delivery. Um, that was the original model. That was sort of the the vision behind it. Um, and in in those you know, if, if you take that tactic, then you would say academic health centers are like way, way far behind. And, you know, it, I, I love UCSF, uh, but I don't think that we have been way ahead of the curve on the integrating social medical care space. Um, I think our county hospitals and our community health centers here in, in the Bay Area um, are, are doing, um, are ahead of us and we have a lot to learn from them. So, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how to answer this question except to say, I would even take it one step farther, which is like the people who come to healthcare are limited. You know, like we're we're um, even if we look at at uh, the social safety net or the safety and healthcare safety net broadly, we're still missing the curve. And that's where the, I feel like the work that Retail Two are doing is so critical: is that we can't only look at the role of the healthcare sector in this space. We have to think about all the other sectors and all the other ways we do this. Like very important work around addressing social adversity um, so that people don't need to come to the healthcare sec sector for help on these on these topics. Um, I think that actually picks up on a comment uh, from a question from Hillary Seligman, who I should point out uh, has a 
speaking of how you take research evidence and research programs and translate it into action and change, she has a brilliant change maker series that she's been hosting that really features people who are incredible scholars, but really have rolled up their sleeves to work with stakeholders to have their work inform and move uh, changes in practice and policy. So uh, you may want to try to tune into Hillary's series as well. But Hillary asked about, it's part of this that, that you know, all these determinants interact with each other and how do we, you know, do we need to have a more integrated approach that looks at, you know, economic policies and, you know, you guys have touched on a bunch of them, economic policies, uh, employment policies, experience of racism, uh, the racial, racial milieu and culture uh, of racism. How are there more holistic ways or ways to capture the, the sort of cumulative effect of these things? I can maybe jump in a little bit on this one. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's there's di different ways to to answer this question. One is to say that sometimes the best ways to capture the the complexity of these relationships is not through sort of the quantitative research that a lot of us on this panel do, and a lot of it is more through qualitative research to hear the the narratives and the nuance in individual um, people's experiences. Um, and then even quantitatively, you know, this isn't a method session, but there's lots of ways that we can sort of, you know, use things like, you know, um, interaction terms to see, like, does it matter if you're, you know, high, you know, have high educational attainment, but low income, is that different than if you have high educational attainment and high income and like, you know, all, all the different combinations. So that's, um, there's certainly analytic ways that we can get at that. And um, uh, people who know me know that I like to talk about data. And I think one of the major limitations in examining all the different um, ways that these interact is that in a lot of cases, we don't have data sets that include all of this information that we're interested in. Um, so, you know, Matt, Matt was talking about like what's in the EHR. Well, that's great. There used to be almost nothing. And so now that's wonderful that like we have this module that's plugged into Epic that SFDPH um, help design that helps us capture some of these social determinants, but there's, uh, you know, a lot more that we're missing and even some of the survey data sets that are out there and other administrative data sets um, don't have a lot on their own and like there's there's all sort of logistic and, and legal issues to, to being able to link them so that we can get this more comprehensive understanding um, of, of, of people's lives and, and which and how to best intervene on these determinants to, to improve health. Um, I think there are, and we probably need to advance more, but there are methods to kind of um, more realistically like mimic the real world. So then, um, but speaking to Rita's comment, like first we need the data harmonized in one place, and then we can actually use some of these advanced methods. So like, you know, multi -met multi-level longitudinal data analysis techniques. And then there's always new ones coming up, especially with um, machine learning models that are changing every day. It seems like every, like it'll be like another week, it'll be another machine learning model. But they, their um, strength is how like analyzing huge amounts of data and then f reducing it down to manageable bits, so manageable clusters or trajectories. And so, um, but to do that, um, we need the, the data. And so then we'll be able to look at the clustering, look at the trajectories, look at the bundles of policies um, and using the various, but yeah, but we need time and place and um, the different the different variables at different levels to do that. All right, you were saying also, some people are using chat, I know, and it's probably better to put your comments in Q and A because the, I think only the panelists can see the chat comments. So if you want other people to know what you're sharing, go ahead and stick it in uh, Q&A, please. Um, uh, yeah, here's, I think this is a, a nice, uh, Mary Gurney uh, says, as a former community pharmacist, how can community pharmacy, uh, pharmacy in general, uh, help add this type of data? You know, particularly when community pharmacists don't have access to EHRs and EMRs. Um, so I think part of this, it gets to the broader issue of how to link data. I think Matt or maybe one of you mentioned this, you know, how to, you have data in EHRs, you have it in pharmacists, you know, pharmacy, prescription information, you have it in um, 
social services agencies about child welfare policy or in local incarceration issues and even here in you know the paramedics may be on a whole different system for emergency response any any thoughts on you know how we can start to thread these together maybe even i don't know first let's start with mary's question if any of you uh have any insights into how to link things like from pharmacist databases to EHR data to weave these together? Or if not, are there some ways any of you have found uh, uh, promising for linking data across systems? Or just tell people that, yeah, this is a huge problem and uh, good luck. I don't know. This is a huge problem. Like, no, no, no. But I, I think it does. It, I, I think Mary brings up a really important question, and I think it also it it's not only a problem of across systems, but I think even within systems themselves. And I think, for, as an example, taking that you know EHR screening module I showed everybody in some systems, you know, uh, not every role, and I mean that a medical assistant. Um, a uh, receptionist, a, uh, a nurse practitioner, a physician, not all of them can either view or edit that, even though it might be that in your clinic, when you're checked in, you're asked about if you have housing, it wouldn't be great if the receptionist could do it. So I, it's sort of like uh, there, there need to be ways to one, allow, um, I think three things, one, documentation access for people, but also you know, um, reading access, right? It might be that you, you're not, you might not want to document it, but at least it should be available for you to view and it should be available. What things across systems might be helpful for us to view, even if you can't edit it. And then I think the last thing is sort of linkages, which is the really hard thing that we're talking a lot about now, um, you know, on the informatics side, but are just coming, there's just so many, uh, there are so many um, challenges just in terms of linking data, you know, within our own health systems that it's, um, it's that that's sort of the biggest lift we're talking about now. So I agree, it's, it's a big, it's a big issue. But I think there are solutions that that can be, you know, that can be found that just might be tiered levels of, you know, permissions to see this, such that people can benefit, um, you know, in terms of adjusting their plans to adjust social needs or take social needs into account. Are there any, so somebody asked about exemplar models. Is there any place either in the US or in other nations that have actually made much more headway in this particular? I mean, let's stick on this theme of really integrated data. Are there particularly systems that have more, you know, universal health programs with a common unique ID for people? Are there, do you, are you aware of any places that have actually linked the social service and healthcare service data better in other? other places? So I just quickly, I, I put in a text answer to that person's mm -hmm. um, question, which is I think in a lot of other high income countries that people's social needs are met through the safety net system, through other social and economic policies like more rob robust unemployment um, benefits, uh, paid leave. Um, I can't remember the other examples I gave, uh, universal health care. Um, and that in the U.S. we don't have that, and um, I think you know we're just uh, more used to spending lots and lots on healthcare in the U.S. And so um, I think it, for policymakers or you know health people in charge of health systems, it seems more natural to sort of incorporate addressing social needs as part of the healthcare system. Um, whereas in other countries, that's, I think that's typically not how it's done. Um, and there's just more robust social policies. So yeah, and I'll, I think Laura, Laura probably knows of the places in the U.S. where, where it's done better, given, given our constraints in the U.S. of not thinking upstream enough to address health. Yeah, so final word, Laura, and then we're gonna, yeah, and then we'll call it a wrap. So oh, I don't want this, this better. This better be good, Laura. Yeah, better, better be good. <laughs> this is sort yeah. of a disappointing final word. Uh, you know, places like Canada that have a, you know, have an identifier, and some of the Scandinavian countries where you can integrate data across systems or um, can do much more interesting work with it. Uh, um, and it's, it's not as cumbersome, like even getting Medicare or Medicaid data is like so crazy painful for us. Um, I, 
there are health systems that are doing remarkably exciting work around integrating um, you know, community information exchanges. I like to look at the work that's happening in San Diego and some of my colleagues, Caroline Fichtenberg and Yuri Cartier are, and Danielle Hessler are doing some fun work with them, thinking about how they can use their community information exchange, um, both uh, within the healthcare sector to like be aware of and respond to social needs, but then also how the health sector data could be used by the community partners um, to improve improve care on on in other sectors um and you know the more we think about it as less you know less healthcare centric the better we're going to do here um so the, i like the san diego 211 model for that reason uh, but there are lots of other places that are doing really innovative work the question is how to scale and sustain it great well that is encouraging laura so we yeah we there are places making headway on this that we can learn from so i you know we're at the hour uh I want to thank all our uh, fabulous uh, speakers today. Uh, thank you much. Please, everybody uh, participating, join me with emojis or just uh, a wave uh, uh, to uh, to thank our speakers uh, for really amazing work you're doing, and thank you for sharing it. I think I think we'll end on the positive notes. I mean, it's really fitting. I think Rita and Laura, some of your concluding comments, because let's honor the founder of the Institute for Health Policy Studies, uh, Philip R. Lee, who was a champion. Uh, in the physician sector, despite the uh, opposition of the American Medical Association to help get Medicare enacted in what I think Phil Lee would have said was the first step towards uh, universal national health insurance. And so maybe we should honor Phil by uh, finishing the job and moving the United States towards a much more civilized approach to uh, universal coverage. And then as Rita says, all the social programs that need to uh, be part of that. All right, got to end with a little political editorial for this. Um, uh, next week, uh, come back and we'll see what the editorial will be, the, be then. Uh, it'll be health system and community embedded health services research, I think really picking up on some of the content here about integrating uh, this kind of work into systems to generate and motivate change. Uh, Andy Auerbach will be the host there and Julia Adler Milstein, Naomi Bardock, Michael Steinman and Janus Yazdane will be the uh, featured presenters. And then mark your calendars because next up on the Institute for Health Policy Studies, um, uh, kind of uh, upscaled uh, efforts to get programs out there will be monthly health policy grand rounds starting uh, Wednesday, uh, March 24th at noon. So uh, do mark that on your, your dates and it's clear the new director uh, Joanne Spetz is really uh, uh, kind of helping to move IHBS uh, to really uh, have a presence to share the great work being done throughout the community here and, and more widely. So thank you all again uh, for participating as speakers and thanks everybody for joining us for this symposium session.